Um, I think uh, there's some privilege that comes with um, material security and privilege that comes with a tenured position at a, at a university uh, that allows me to say, I think, I think fairly well. Um, Chicago is kind of hitting the apex of the uh, crisis now and the, the numbers are increasing. Uh, but we are still able to go out for walks. We're still able to have some of the privileges that we can, you know, go get groceries, things like that. Um, so given those circumstances, you know, as a professor, I was able to move all of my classes online. So uh, there is a benefit to having some established privileges and security in our culture right now. I think the toughest thing has been um, the class that I was teaching this semester was down at Statefield Correctional Center, which is a maximum security prison uh, about an hour outside of Chicago, mostly Chicago uh, folks who are in that prison. Uh, we, of course, had to shut that down um, and we was not, and were not able to conduct online courses or any form of courses there. Now we're doing trying to do some correspondence there. So that feels like a huge loss that uh, we had started to build a, an incredible community with um, some of these students and, um, and that was taken away. So that was a loss. Uh, but maybe more on top of that was that um, uh, two of our students have died uh, in Stateville. Um, just the circumstances in a prison where they're in close quarters and uh, they shut down the prison, uh, brought in the National Guard to set up temporary hospitals and uh, temporary beds, uh, but it still wasn't enough uh, at this point. Uh, unfortunately, um, I think 45 cases of coronavirus uh, of, of infection in the prison that I teach at, and uh, six have died, and two of them, unfortunately, have been uh, um, our students, and uh, one was a particularly close student of mine. So um, it's this really combination of for myself personally feeling privileged and uh, feeling like uh, I've been kind of protected in this uh, both in some of the fallout um, but the, the the tremendous pain the incredible pain of having lost a loved one and a friend and, and one of my students yeah some of you know that I wrote a book on lament uh, several years ago and I framed it through the lens of uh, of racial justice and social justice. Um, and I'm going back to that now, and I'm actually trying to figure out ways to kind of re-engage re that material a little bit more. Um, so for me, spiritually, the practice of lament that I had tried to reintroduce into my own life several years back, and I had tried to get churches and Christian communities to uh, reintegrate back into the life of the church. And my idea, my thought, uh, and very common thought was that uh, the American church has no capacity or very little capacity to lament suffering. And so when suffering does come along, we don't know how to deal with it. Uh, so for me personally, my spiritual walk, um, the practice of lament that I've tried to reintegrate back into my life has been helpful uh, because I have something to fall back on. And I think many American Christians are so caught up in a triumphalistic, exceptionalistic, we're going to beat this thing no matter what type of uh, approach, this kind of... Um, yeah, this exceptionalism, this triumphalism that, hey, American Christians can handle anything, you know, nothing's going to harm us. We can go out there and have church services and none of us are going to get the virus. And there's a special protection and provision that we have um, when the scripture actually testifies to God's people are not exempt from suffering. Uh, and so for me to kind of dig in the, deeper into the wells of scripture, which talk about suffering and um, how we can... Uh, still trust in God in the midst of suffering, not because things are going to be okay overnight. Um, the Book of Lamentations, for example, it's about the suffering that people are in the middle of and aren't going to overcome overnight. In fact, it takes several decades before that suffering uh, finds a resolution, and it's not the resolution they want even. Um, but um, I think Christians, especially in the U.S., especially in the West, uh, really have trouble grasping that concept that there are times when suffering and pain is in the world. And I think for me to go back to the scriptures where lament is a, a central part or a critical part of one's faith journey uh, has given me some of the spiritual landmarks and markers to be able to say, yeah, God is not absent. absent. It's just that I'm, I'm seeing uh, God in the midst of lament and not just in the midst of celebration. Lament to me is truth-telling, and you see this all throughout scripture. 
Uh, when you, when the people cry out and lament to God, it's telling the truth back to God. God, we're suffering. God, we're in pain. God, things are not the way they're supposed to be. And I think God likes truth telling. Um, I don't think God wants people to make stuff up to kind of sugarcoat everything. Uh, to say things, well, I, I don't need to get into this, but <laughs> there's stuff out there that's just like, oh, everything's going to be okay when the sunlight comes out. Everything's going to be okay if you take this medicine. Everything's going to be okay if you inject yourself with disinfectants. Well, that's not the way it works. That's not life. Um, and so I think God honors truth-telling and says, yeah, we're going through a place of struggle and pain, and lament is our honest truth talking to God. And um, I think God would rather have us talk to him in truthfulness rather than lies and falsehood or kind of making up scenarios that aren't true. Uh, so, and I think God responds in truthfulness. Uh, and sometimes he'll say, you're going to have to wait a little bit longer. You're going to have to endure the suffering a little bit longer. Uh, he might say, things are going to look different than they have looked for the last 40 years of your life and of your, of your ministry even. Um, but that, starts when we begin to talk truth to God and to each other rather than making up falsehoods. The honesty and truth telling again, um, that, uh, you know, faith and Christianity is not a placebo. It's not like a sugar pill that, you know, you feel good about yourself uh, as it goes down. You think you've taken a remedy. Uh, faith is sometimes real medicine. Uh, faith is sometimes um, the hard, the bitter pill to swallow. Um, and I think leaders need to be telling the truth. Now, in the midst of truth, there can be hope. So, you know, what I write about is part of lament and the part of the power of lament is that if God is faithful to judge and we acknowledge that judgment, if God is faithful to his word to say, if there is rebellion, then there is judgment. If there is uh, disobedience, then there are consequences. Um, if God is faithful to judge, uh, he's true to his word, then he's true to his word about redemption and he's true to his word about hope. Uh, but I think many of us want to get to the redemption and hope so quickly that we are doing a disservice to our congregations. We're doing a disservice to those that we lead because we are so quick to say, Let's make things better than they are. Let's jump to the happy going, happy conclusion uh, without thinking there might be some suffering along the way. So I think leaders now need to give a little snapshot of that truth. Um, and I also believe that crisis reveals some, some deep fissures and deep um, uh, problems in our, in our culture and in our communities and in our, in our churches as well. Uh, for example, here in Chicago, uh, the, the rate of infection and death for brown and black bodies of African Americans and Latinos, uh, particularly African Americans, is ridiculously disproportional to the rest of uh, the population. Um, what this crisis has done, it has unearthed these deeply rooted uh, injustices and inequalities uh, that African Americans are dying at uh, extremely high numbers compared to the rest of society uh, because there were these deep rooted injustices uh, such as incarceration such as a lack of access to health care and healthy foods. Um, and we got to tell the truth about that as well. Um, and I think the honesty in leadership is what might be lacking in our society right now. Uh, to say, uh, especially as Christians, if we're not telling the truth, if we're not being honest, if we're not saying this is what the Lord says and this is what the scripture says in particular, uh, but that this is a hard medicine that we need to take, um, and it might change us. We might not have our 401ks go back to the way they were, you know, three months ago. We might not have the economy that we had three months ago. Um, but the honest truth telling by leadership, especially spiritual moral leadership, is absolutely essential to understand.